Hello my dears, welcome to part two of our deep dive into the past and present of institutions. Today we are going to talk about the troubled teen industry. It's not going to be pretty. Uh, content warning for everything one could need a content warning for, but as I said in my last one, I only talk about traumatic content if it feels necessary for learning. I'm going to keep things as minimal and light as possible to get my point across. You can fill in the blanks yourself with your own research if you so desire. If you're new here, hi, my name is Sydney. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an openly queer, disabled, autistic, trans, non-binary actor, composer, educator, and disability advocate. I make videos about things in those categories. I'm also making world history with a thesis right now that's vaguely related to those topics. You can learn all about that at the links in my description if you want to learn more about who I am and what I do. Also, I am a white person in my early 20s with uh, shoulder length light brown curly hair, a white button up with teal flowers on it, and I am sitting in front of a bookshelf. Oh, and I'm wearing uh, clear round glasses. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this video is a part two. You don't really need to watch them in order to understand this one. This one also won't be redundant of the last one. It's kind of a completely different adjacent topic, but the other video might give a nice basis to understanding this one because it's more the history of the wider history of institutions and institutionalization as a whole, as well as present day institutions is linked at the top of the description and in the card above if you would like to take a gander over there first and then come on back to this one. Now for a very brief history of institutions in the United States, public state institutions became a thing in the early to mid 1800s. They started off with great intentions and seemed to function pretty well honestly, but the thing is we didn't really know anything about mental health care. Also institutions also included all kinds of people, not just the mentally ill, but also disabled people, women who spoke their minds, and relatives that people just kind of wanted to get rid of. But anyway, as more people were getting admitted to institutions, there weren't very many people leaving them, which made people just pile up and resources got very low, abuse became the norm, and thus begins the cycle of people going, our institutions are underregulated, underfunded, and understaffed, and we gotta do something about it. Ah, fighting for a little bit, having small superficial changes made, and then forgetting about the mission for about 20 years until the cycle begins again. And literally it was about every 20 years or so, this same thing would happen over and over and over again in history. It's very interesting. Anyway, that's the other video. In 1963, John F. Kennedy signed legislation to close as many institutions as possible and replace them with therapeutic centers and at-home care, starting the mass deinstitutionalization process. There were two waves. The first one was in the 1960s as new antipsychotic drugs hit the market and other mental health services were put in place. And then the second wave was in the 1970s, specifically focused on freeing those with developmental disabilities. There were also some important Supreme Court cases um, that gave patients the right to refuse treatment and restricting states' abilities to detain anybody involuntarily for or mental illness. Most institutions as we think of them today were closed by the early 2000s, which is a win. However, those at-home supports that were promised by JFK never really happened. My primary guess being that he was assassinated less than a month after signing the Community Mental Health Act in 1963, and therefore we don't have proper disability mental health or elder care really available right now. Um, like we have proper options, but there are not enough of them and they're often not covered by insurance. And this leaves us with modern institutions like nursing homes and assisted living centers, with prisons being the largest mental health care facility that we have, housing 2 million mentally ill people today, 10 times as many mentally ill people in jails each year as our in-state funded psychiatric treatment. Which is really great. In regards to children, which is more of our focus for today's video, children's institutions did not become a thing until the 1930s, and before that time kids just went to regular adult institutions. Children's institutions and facilities became a thing in the 1930s because that's when people realized that child psychology is in fact different from adult psychology, and when people decided that mental illness prevention was the primary form of treatment and that therefore we should stop these behaviors early to prevent complete mental illness and falling apart, I don't know, down the line, which led to not only the creation of psychiatric care for children, but also the large expansion of reform schools, therapeutic boarding schools, boot camps, wilderness therapy programs, all those things for kids to try to fix them early. If you're having a hard time picturing reform school energy, think Crunchum Hall from Matilda, but make it a boarding school, yeah? The Matilda analogy is gonna come up down the line. Anyway, in the 1970s, as adult patients were getting more rights, we saw the opposite impact on kids. There was the satanic panic. Oh, once you think of the children or like, my child smoked weed once and they're destined to be a problem child who's forever addicted to everything and will die that way situation. Um, which meant more supply and demand for these programs, which led to a sharp increase in the amount of residential programs for kids. And this begins the troubled teen industry, described by Breaking Code Silence as an expansive network of residential programs and facilities which claim to treat, reform, or rehabilitate troubled youth. The origins of the modern TTI can be traced back to Synanon, an alternative drug rehabilitation program turned cult from the 1960s and 70s that disbanded in the early 1980s because of an attempted murder as one does. 
They were known to break addictions through breaking people, using isolation, humiliation, hard labor, sleep deprivation, and a method of group therapy they called the game, where people gathered in a circle and subjected each other to hours of vicious, brutal criticism, which would make people hate themselves enough to change themselves. And at its start, it was widely seen as something super legitimate and successful. Tons of famous people visited and supported it. There was a movie made about it. And the idea of scared straight and of tough love therapy being successful got into the public consciousness because of Sindanon, which coupling that with the rise of the 1960s and 70s drug and free love culture and with conservative parents, you can see where this is going. Reform schools that functioned very similarly to CTIs and also very similarly to jails had existed since the 30s, but the first Sinanon-based private therapeutic boarding school called the Sea-Doo High School was founded in California by a former Sinanon member in 1967. They ended up, I don't know if franchising is the right word, but they combined in 1998 with the Brown Schools Incorporated, a company that had been um, operating chains of reform schools since the 1940s, and they had campuses all over the country. They ended up filing for bankruptcy in 2005. Other schools you might know the names of include the Elan School in Maine, which was founded in 1970, as was the Seed in Florida. In 1971, we have the Provo Canyon School, which opened in Utah, and in 1989 was the Turnabout Ranch, um, also in Utah. You may know Provo Canyon as the TTI that Paris Hilton went to. We're gonna talk about her documentary in a bit. And Turnabout Ranch is the one that Dr. Phil endorses and sends most kids from his show to. Um, and there have been allegations of assault and abuse. And also I believe Provo Canyon is where somebody got murdered at some point as well. Their track record isn't very good. We're not gonna talk too much about Dr. Phil in this episode because I just, I don't enjoy him or care about him particularly, but he does endorse uh, one of these programs on his show and talks about tough love therapy and how important it is, and he is furthering the troubled teen industry, so good for him. The big conglomerates that you may have heard of include CEDU, which closed in 2005, WASPS, which is the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs and Schools, which operated from 1998 to 2009, and the Aspen Education Group, which began operations in 1998. Aspen Education Group has had a lot of scandals of late, so many of their schools have since closed and then reopened under the company name of Family Help and Wellness, Turnabout Ranches and Aspen School, I believe. Generally, if a scandal happens in one of these schools, usually being the death of a student, because yes, that happens, very frequently. Um, a school would just change its name and its leadership, usually just shuffling around the same group of people into other programs in the system, and then reopen completely as normal. I'm not sure what happened in 1998 to make three giant conglomerates all create their programs and spawn a gazillion troubled teen in institutions at once, but I guess here we are. Um, in theory though, right, like therapeutic boarding schools should be a good thing if they're done right, right? Maybe? Hopefully? We all know the answer is going to be no. The answer is no. Um, even if they are sometimes a good thing for some people, I know approximately two people who had, had a good time at wilderness therapy and like 30 who didn't. Um, the vast majority of cases we hear about are reports of abuse and trauma. So their track record is distinctly not good. So we're going to talk about some of the hallmarks of troubled teen programs. Also, um, some of them are faith-based and some of them are not. Some of them also include, include conversion therapy and some do not. That depends on the program. Now, the first thing is getting there. It is common for uh, troubled teen programs to use approved escort services, which rather than going, hello child, we are putting you into a program and risking them, I don't know, running away or something, you hire this escort service to come to your house, wake the kid up at 4 a.m., often handcuff them, put them in a van, and drive them either straight to the school or to the airport where they will be put onto a plane and brought to their program. And often they will not be spoken to this entire process. So that's legally kidnapping. And I cannot imagine experiencing that and thinking, maybe my parents will save me from these people that are taking me away in the middle of the night, only to later learn that my parents actually hired the people to do that. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't even fathom processing that. Um, the schools are usually in fairly remote places, often in the wilderness of Utah, California, Florida, Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, or Texas. Most of the parent companies are run out of Utah because they have the least legislation about these schools. And many programs will also operate outside of the US, such as Tranquility Bay, which is in Jamaica. Um, and they talk about the reasons for them being so remote is because it's expansive land that will help the students to heal and they can, you know, work on the land and it's really great and good for their health. And this connects kind of two ideas. The first being our association of the isolation of large green spaces of early asylums and sanatoriums as being helpful. And the second is a version of the scared straight idea. If we give these kids enough structure and manual labor, if they work this land and get in touch with nature again, they're gonna fix themselves. 
Keep in mind that there was a Supreme Court legislation in 1973 that prevented patients in psychiatric facilities from doing unpaid manual labor, as it encouraged programs to keep their beds full solely to get free labor. But since kids can't get paid for labor legally anyway, there is a loophole there, which means a lot of programs will overwork their kids to the point of exhaustion, malnourishment, and in many cases, heat stroke and death with virtually no recourse. And yes, as I mentioned earlier, kids do die in these programs all the time. Now, speaking of legislation, there is also the uh, 1975 ruling that established the right of a patient to refuse treatment, and a 1978 ruling restricting states from confining anybody involuntarily for a mental illness past 72 hours. This, again, does not apply to minors. Whoever has custody of the kids has these rights on behalf of the child instead. And the contracts parents sign when enrolling their children in these programs typically gives 50% or more of custody over to the program at the time the child is enrolled. Parents who try to pull their kids from these programs often have a very difficult time because of this, um, and often parents don't try to pull their kids because they trust the program to know more about the child's mental health and medical needs than they do, which given the fact that many of the doctors in these programs do not have medical degrees or licensing, is usually not the case. Some states give informed consent and refusal to treatment rights to kids age 12 or older, but many states such as Utah, which we're gonna to return to in a bit, are parents' rights states, where parents can make full medical decisions on behalf of their children under the age of 18. These programs also will often tell parents right at the beginning, the child's probably gonna lie about abuse um, to try to get out of the program because they're a defiant teen who won't wanna be there. So if you hear any, I don't know, allegations from the kid, just ignore them. They're not real. Um, to be fair, it's pretty hard to even hear those allegations anyway because most letters are read and censored and also many programs don't even allow letters or otherwise communication with the outside world until they earn it at a certain threshold in the program. It's also common for programs to hold various basic comforts and uh, human rights as rewards for good behavior, such as not letting a student speak to anybody except their therapist for the first two weeks of a program, and then slowly allowing them to have monitored conversations with other students on pre-approved topics. I have also heard stories of programs where students were not allowed to touch anyone else or be touched by anyone else for their entire time in this program, which could be up to six months that does something to a person. Um, sleep deprivation and food deprivation are also common in these programs. Many will have some sort of wilderness quest where they send you out into the wilderness with no food for three days or so as part of a treatment program. And they will also use excessive drugs, um, force and restraint. Um, commonly you can find these in a lot of trouble teen programs. I should also probably mention that these things cost as much as your typical private school and are very rarely covered by insurance or financial aid. One of the programs I did a deep dive into was, we're gonna talk about that one in a bit, was like a 5,500 enrollment fee and then a daily fee of about $900. The industry is obviously super unregulated, so all the numbers are pretty sketchy, but as best we know, there are around 1,500 facilities in the United States or internationally, but run by US companies. There's only a few left at this point because other countries have laws against this stuff and have been closing them down. Um, and there's between 10,000 and 120,000 students housed in these programs at any given time. But before we break down why this happens and where it's going today and what we can do about it, let's talk for a moment about the personal side of this discussion for me. Um, I normally, even with sad topics, will try to have a little more energy in my videos than I do right now, but I just, I don't have it in me. Um, obviously, as a disabled person existing in the field of disability and mental health, I know a lot of people who've been through this industry because they often come out the other side with disabilities um, and, and into the mental health and disability community. But I also grew up with somebody who was on a very similar diagnostic, something's physically wrong with this child, but we do not know what path as I was. Um, and we became really close friends because of that. And then she just disappeared. And I, knowing how things work in the undiagnosed chronic illness community, just assumed after a while that she probably died and nobody reached out to tell me because they forgot. Um, and then three years later, a photo of an older her just appeared on my Instagram feed. And I reached out and I learned that she had gone to one program with the intention of just being there for a few weeks. Um, but then from there was forced to go to another program by the people in charge of the first one and then ended up in a third one, each one more abusive than the last program. And she finally left the last one because of the pandemic. And this was the same time I was in brain damage recovery. So we spent hours on the phone together every day for a lot of the pandemic, just talking through our experiences. And I remember in that moment being like, I'm, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel one day and I'm gonna talk about this because everybody should be talking about this and no, not enough people are talking about this. And here we are three years later, finally getting up the strength to do it. I'm also happy to say that just a few months later, um, the movement trying to close these schools absolutely exploded thanks to Paris Hilton. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more shortly, but I just wanted to explain why this topic is particularly close to home for me and why I'm not just here like, hey, I've heard about these things and I would like to rant about things I don't have experience with to throw more of the medical industrial complex under the bus because I keep doing that on this channel. Um, this is this is very real and this is more common than you think it is. So 
Just wanted to throw that in there. But anyway, let's look at why this business continues to flourish despite everything being objectively terrible with it. The first, like we talked about earlier, is the fact that parents are told, well, your child's gonna lie about abuse to get out of here. We saw this situation with adult institutions as well, even in the 1800s. Um, once you're declared crazy or mentally ill, or in this case, a troubled youth, or incorrigible or something like that, it's suddenly okay to not treat these people like humans and dismiss everything that they say is completely made up. And these programs also often refer to students as numbers rather than their names to further dehumanize them so that they're not going to speak up. And then all males heavily censored. Often the journals or notes that students keep while in the program are kept by programs upon their release. So it's really easy for them to go home and hear everybody talk about how much better you are and how good the program was for you and kind of convince yourself that like, oh, maybe all that abuse never happened. Uh, maybe I just completely made that up. And it's very easy to convince yourself of that. If you wanna learn more about gaslighting abuse and false memories, I have a how to keep yourself safe deep dive video up here you can check out. Um, but most of the tools that I talk about in this video are impossible to use in these programs. And that is deliberate. Also, because many programs do not use student names, Students are unable to find each other after they leave the program to talk through their experiences or support each other. There's a subreddit called Troubled Teens that I've linked below, we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, that lists every single program, its history and testimonials from it. And reading through them, you find so many people just trying to find people from their program for the first time. Sometimes 10 years after their time there, they finally find somebody else with that experience, suddenly realize they're not alone and that it wasn't made up and it wasn't their fault or whatever and begin that healing process. And this also makes it very easy for programs to get away with things because there isn't the ability for a unifying force against them. Or by the time that there is, the statute of limitations is up because you typically have to file a lawsuit within four years of something happening. And if you're 13 years old when this happens to you, when are you going to go and file a lawsuit? Not to mention that TTI programs with sketchy histories are gonna change their names a lot, they're gonna change ownership a lot, and they're generally really, really good at hiding from authority, if authority even looks for them, which they don't. We're gonna get there shortly. So my next question is, are these places even accredited or licensed? Like, is there anybody to investigate them when things go wrong because things go wrong? And the answer is, uh, I guess. In a lot of the states where these programs happen, licensing is very easily granted because there are very few regulations in place. And there's also very few regulators to do the regulating. So they just kind of give out licenses because they don't know what else to do with themselves. There also isn't the incentive for regulations. Utah, for example, which is a state that about 34% of troubled teens go to for programs makes hundreds of millions for the Utah economy every year. So when they do get caught being unlicensed or, you know, abusing children, it's usually just a fine that is effectively a slap on the wrist for the school and things just move on as normal. In 2007, the Government Accountability Office actually tried to investigate the troubled teen industry because they acknowledged it was a systemic problem and they concluded that the school labels and state licensing rules were too ambiguous to actually do anything and then didn't try to get the states to fix them on the state level. There was also legislation introduced to the House of Representatives in 2005 called the End Institutional Abuse Against Children Act, meant to close down most of these schools that was never enacted. In more recent history, a hashtag was created in 2014 as a collaboration between a few TTI survivor um, advocacy networks, which is called Breaking Code Silence. Code silence is a term often used in trouble teen programs for when they restrict the communication of patients as a form of punishment. So in Breaking Code Silence, survivors stand up against these programs and testify about their experiences. They also became able to find and support each other via this hashtag, finally. And in September of 2020, Paris Hilton released her This Is Paris documentary, which talked about her life growing up in the trouble teen industry and the abuses that she faced at Provo Canyon School in Utah and how in order to cope she created this whole ditzy party girl persona. It caused a lot of people to learn about this industry for the first time that otherwise never would have heard of it. It also sparked a lot of outrage and eventually a large protest and demonstration of survivors outside of Provo Canyon School. The pandemic also caused many schools to send students home for a time and everybody ended up spending more time online, which led to massive growth of this online movement. Um, and if you have a moment to spare, I highly recommend going through uh, the Breaking Code Silence website. It is very well made as resources for survivors to find each other and or to tell their stories for parents unsure what to do with their kids who had potentially intended to send their kid to a TTI but have found this website instead for lawmakers pushing for legislation and there's also an in memoriam page for all the children who have died at these facilities that we know of. In 2021, thanks to Breaking Code Silence's work, Utah signed a bill starting some regulations of these institutions, the first in 15 years, um, that stated that programs may not use a cruel, severe, unusual, or unnecessary practice on a child, including a strip search, a body cavity search, inducing pain to obtain compliance, hyperextending joints, peer restraints, discipline or punishment that is intended to frighten or humiliate, required treatment centers to maintain suicide prevention policies, and otherwise proposed to end abusive practices in these programs. Does it concern me that they needed a law to go, hey, you can't strip search children? Yeah, 
Yeah, it does. Do I think that these laws are gonna make a huge difference? Unless they start having random inspections without prior warning, I honestly don't know. But the fact that lawmakers are paying attention to this now and are starting to try to do something is a very, very big deal and that gives me hope. There's also been more money allocated, uh, I believe federally, but at least statewide, to creating more full-time positions to handle licensing for this program, these programs. And there is discussion in the community about the federal government looking into more federal oversight and potentially banning cross-state transport, which would render most of the legal kidnappings illegal, potentially making all escort services obsolete which would be really cool because what? No. But the next question is why does this happen? These programs have been doing this stuff unchanged since the 1970s and they're well known for their abusive practices. So why is this still happen? Why, why is this still an effective business model? First of all, the government effectively encourages it. We know that it also makes a whole lot of money, but why would parents send their kid to one of these programs or voluntarily hire an escort service? Like what? Or why would a kid voluntarily go to one? The answer is marketing. These programs are really, really good at marketing. Because here's the thing, as we talked about in part one, mental health care services in this country are a disaster. There are not enough therapists, there are not enough residential beds, there are not enough outpatient options and long wait lists for care. So when you feel like you're in crisis, a program that is willing to take your kid right now and ensure you that they are the best care that there is, and this is a, a program that has pictures of beautiful farmland and kids holding hands and smiling in front of sunsets on their website. And maybe this is a program that has been recommended by a school guidance counselor. That's the option that you're going to choose. Sure, it may not be covered by insurance and therefore cost you what was going to be their college tuition, but this is an immediate life or death em emergency. So it's worth it right now and everything else can get sorted out down the line because, well, if we don't stop the behavior now, they may not live long enough to need a college tuition. These programs work with, or rather prey on, parents who are in that frantic panic mode of, oh my gosh, I just learned that my kid has suicidal ideation, so it means they could attempt tomorrow, so I need to put them in 24 hour surveillance care right now and wrap them up in bubble wrap, otherwise they're going to explode. Which is not necessarily the most effective method of treating them and also, when you're in that panic mode, you can't think clearly to make proper decisions. And again, trouble teen industries know that. Inciting incidents for admission to these programs, other than kids just having long struggles with addictions or mental health issues um, and parents doing research over a long period of time, it's usually parents immediately learning about suicidal ideation, um, that their kid smoked pot or did a drug once, that they're sexually active, that they change religions, that they're gay, or that um, a behavioral problem like lashing out at their parents suddenly happened, which as a teacher who tends to get the outcast kids trauma dumping to them for hours at a time, which is why I don't teach anymore, um, the vast majority of those behaviors are because the kids having issues either at home or at school or something else that they're trying to cope with that they're trying to express and nobody's listening to them or taking them seriously. And so they get increasingly stressed until they either externally explode with behavioral problems or they internally explode with self-harming behavior, which often will include eating disorders or drug use. This is very similar to the behavior that's a hallmark of pathological demand avoidance or persistent demand for autonomy, which I have a video about up here. We just talked about that a few weeks ago. But a lot of parents in these panic moments of everything going a little wacky can't process the full reality of all of this, or they refuse to process the full reality because they don't want to admit that the problem child is in fact a problem because of their own behavior, but we're gonna get there in a second. And instead they're like, okay, so my option is my child either stays home and they die, become a pregnant teen, go to prison, um, or they can go to a therapeutic boarding school and we can fix the problem and then they'll be a perfect human after that. And there's so many more options than that. And also that's not how those options work. But when you're in a panic and you're Googling things to try to find a way out, this is kind of the option that comes up. But the thing is, while these behaviors feel completely out of the blue or without cause, they usually have some sort of cause behind it, even if you can't quite see it. And a lot of the kids that come out of these programs talk about how it was a response to an issue with the whole family system, um, but the parents didn't want to deal with that and instead saw sending their kids away as a better solution. And these programs enforce the idea that the kid's behavior is in a vacuum and that they're just a bad kid and that sending them away is the perfect solution because it's all the kid's fault and they just need some tough love to get them back on track, which already starts this cycle of not listening to the child involved or actually putting their needs first, which is going to further hurt them when they're in these places. And by the time the kid is there, the parents have put so much money and energy into this thing, they want to believe it's effective. And also like, they feel like they have no other options. They're told they have no other options. So they want to believe that it works. And who's gonna blame them? Like they trust that these people are professionals in what they do, that these programs are gonna know more about child psychology than they do, and that the programs know what is best for their kids more than they do. So they ignore what their kid is trying to tell them. They put all of their faith into other adults who run these programs to do the right thing. Because they're adults, so they must know what's going on and they must be doing the right thing. But given the cost of these programs and how these programs are typically run, 
It seems like doing the right thing is pretty rare on, on their end. But to be clear, I'm not saying that inpatient care or residential treatment when necessary is not effective or helpful or useful. I want to be very clear on that. But what I am saying is that troubled teen programs as a method of treatment are often more harmful than helpful. And also that residential treatment should be a last resort option. We're going to talk about alternative options and residential treatment in a second um, and how to tell a TTI from a reasonable residential program in a bit. Um, I will also say that I'm being a lot more lenient with the parents than a lot of the things that I read. A lot of the testimonials from kids talked about how they smoked pot once and their parents just sent them away or that sending them away was used as a threat instead of actually parenting them and then eventually they gave up and sent them. There's one where like a mom had a new boyfriend and they decided to just send the kid off to one of these schools. It's not unlike we saw with reform schools in the 1940s movies where parents just like got tired of parenting because parenting teens is very difficult and so they just sent them off to boarding schools so they didn't have to deal with them anymore. Often rich parents will send their kids to a regular boarding school, the kid will get a little wild there, and then a parent will transfer them to a therapeutic boarding school to fix them and then into the system they go. But in keeping with the theme that I want to believe that everybody has the best intentions regardless of how terrible the execution may be, but then if we're bringing in the Matilda uh, analogy, maybe not everybody. Anyway, I do want to point, uh, put in a quote from another video that I watched while researching for this video. It's um, from the channel Luminati. If you don't watch them, you really got to go do that. Uh, but she has deep dive videos into several of these programs, which I've linked in the description if you're interested in learning more about individual programs. I just wanted to include this quote because it, yeah, it's just really important. Now, before I end today's episode, I'm going to leave you guys with some words from Maya Slavitz a reporter and author featured in this documentary because I feel like she sums up the situation better than I could. There is absolutely no evidence that this does anything other than produce post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and in some cases, a brief period of compliance. A lot of people will tell you it worked for me. I can't say that 12 step program saved my life because that's what happened to help when I ended up getting into recovery. I mean, I can say that, but the reality is that I don't know that. That's an anecdote. And even if it's my anecdote and I believe it very strongly, it's still an anecdote. And if we're going to say that addiction and mental illnesses are diseases, then we have to have medical standards of evidence. And by the medical standards of evidence, there is no data that suggests that this helps people. And there are lots of things suggesting that it does harm. One of the reasons that Elon and these emotional growth boarding school kind of places caught on with parents is a lot of parents wanted to avoid psychiatric labels and wanted to avoid medications. And so they kind of figured if I send my kid to a place for bad kids, it's better than sending them to a place for sick kids. And they didn't realize kind of how weird that actually is. These places sort of show that there's still an enormous stigma on mental illness and addiction. There's always been this sort of thread since Sparta where, you know, we can make tough people by putting them through tough things. But that doesn't mean that we should traumatize people. So let's talk about finding or spotting these programs and what alternative options we have instead. Now, when I was researching for this video, I remembered the name of one of the programs that my friend had been to and talked to me about. And so I pulled up their website for the sake of preserving this person's identity. I'm not going to link up below, not going to give specifics, but I wanted to use this uh, thing that I have a lot of personal experience with to figure out what one could learn from the website for that program. And if I would send myself or my kid there, because here's the thing, young people send themselves to these programs all the time too. And while troubled teen conversations are more common on social media now, than they were years ago, I wanted to know what it would be like if I was told by a guidance counselor, oh, I think this program would be really great for you to do over the summer or something like that and handed this program that my friend went to um, to me and I didn't know anything about it. Like what, what would happen? Um, I also sent it without context to some of my friends to get their opinions on the program as well because I knew that I would be a little bit biased looking into it. Um, either from like a, would you bring yourself to this program? Or if you're at wit's end with your mentally ill child, would you send them here angle? And uh, this is what I learned. So glancing through the website on my own, honestly, it seemed pretty nice. They had a lot of really pretty photos. They talked about their experiential learning program and their therapy programs. Um, they had a page that talked about like what they were 
capable of dealing with in therapy and what they weren't, so that seemed pretty transparent. Um, they also had a page with all the staff and all the photos of them on there. There was an FAQ page where they answered questions about the licensures that they had, which looked pretty legit. Um, they mentioned breaking code silence specifically in their um, FAQs and said they stand with the movement and they've made significant changes. They don't accept students via escort programs. Um, they also wrote about how in 2020 their license expired or something and they got in trouble for it, but they dealt with it and they did not have to close down while that happened and they handled it and they acknowledge it was a problem and it's never gonna happen again. So they seem pretty transparent and honest in all of these things. Um, the price and the lack of insurance coverage for that price was a big red flag for me. I also wish there had been bios and all the people working there rather than just photos of them and their names. Um, and it was definitely vague on the programming that happened there, but it specifically said like, oh, we're being vague because that's part of the education process and the treatment program, which I guess I kind of get maybe. Honestly, the amount of information on this website was the same amount of information that I got from my study abroad program before I went there. so. Either my study abroad program was also sketchy or this is reasonable. It really could go either way, I'm not sure. Frankly, it could be both. Anyway, my friends came up with kind of the same conclusion as I did. It looked pretty chill. There were definitely some gaps in information. There was a couple questions about stuff that wasn't on there and the price was a lot, but otherwise it seemed like a decent program that they definitely think about either going to or sending their kid to if they felt necessary. Though well, I will say, that at least two of them said, well, I wouldn't send my kid to a program unless I'd exhausted every other option first because I don't really like programs in general and I think that I should parent them at home. And I was like, <laughs> you are 18 years old and you are very wise, my friend. Anyway, after that preliminary look, I pulled up the checklist from Breaking Code Silence that they have on their website called Indicators of Abuse for things to look at with programs when you're looking at programs um, to see if I could find any other red flags based on their guide that I missed from just first interacting with the thing plainly. Um, one of them is that uh, this program does not allow visitors and even though it's in it is in a small town slash city but it's generally pretty far from everywhere um, it's also all the way across the country um, and there weren't bios in any of the staff members and there seemed to be maybe some form of unpaid physical labor component but that was unclear. Otherwise seemed to generally pass their checklist with mostly flying colors and some of these things I could pretty easily explain away. So the next step was to begin Googling. This is where I discovered that um, the founders of this program all used to work in lead positions at confirmedly abusive troubled teen programs before founding this one. I also learned that some of the doctors specialize in various forms of, I would call it alternative medicine, but that seems too nice of a way to put it. Straight up pseudoscience quackery stuff? Should not be running a medical institution? Um, many of the staff also are from confirmedly abusive troubled teen programs run by CEDU and Aspen Education Group, some of which they left after students died there, um, and that none of the therapists are legally certified to be practicing in the state that they are practicing in, and I found a whole section of a subreddit tr of the troubled teens indexed solely about abuses logged from this particular program. But had I not known to trust my gut and look more into these people, or known where to look to find these testimonials and stories, I would have seen this as a pretty decent program. Had I not known my friend's experience and felt the need for residential care, I may have even thought about going to this place, or at least I, I definitely would have had it been cheaper. It looks wonderful, but that's because they are very, very good at marketing and making you feel like they know how to fix the problem that they're here to help. And now you can just go and you can just let go and trust them to handle it. Because they also have a young adult program there. Like I literally could go right now if I wanted. I'm not going to, but it's an option. Um, and that's an easy trap to fall into, either for a parent at their wit's end who just wants to let go and be like, okay, they're gonna handle it, or for a person really struggling with their own mental health. But we know the truth behind all of this. We know that the idea of breaking people down to nothing to build them back up better is not effective as a learning tool. It does not help people grow or cope with things. All it does is just abuse people into compliance, which, um, when those people are children causes serious long-term damage and there's no amount of inappropriate or dysfunctional or violent or whatever behavior that justifies abuse at all ever. I will also say bringing back our Matilda image from earlier because I was I was researching for this video and I was getting very upset so I had to take a break and I needed to watch Matilda because it's one of my reviews um for this month and um I was like oh my gosh this this is like a troubled teen institution this is like a reform school um all of those kids, all of the adults were saying that they were terrible people. All of the adults were saying that they were problem children and complaining about them and being like, you guys are all awful. When in reality, they were just kids being kids and they ended up all revolting against Trunchbull because that's what they needed to do at the end. But like, you see that this breaking down behavior, this breaking down treatment, even in Matilda, which is like an allegory on some level, is not effective. And this is the same situation, just different, but it's the same kind of thing. So if that helps you to picture it better, um, to give you an image better, um, 
Yeah, hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully that made sense. I don't know. Anyway, let's talk about what options might be instead. The first thing that we noted in part one of this series, I guess, or two part video, is that residential and or inpatient treatment should always be a last resort. Studies have shown that being uprooted and put into an inpatient program, whether voluntarily or not, is an inherently traumatic experience. Also in-home or otherwise outpatient care has been shown by tons and tons of research to be less expensive, more effective, and significantly less likely to end up in abuse. And one of the reasons that they are effective as somebody who's done extensive outpatient care um, is that you can start using the tools immediately in your everyday life and see what works and what doesn't work and go back and go, okay, this was helpful in this situation and this wasn't. And when you're in crisis mode, you can be like, okay, I'm just gonna pause on this because I know that in like three more days, I'm gonna have help on this. You can also start to realize how the microcosm you live in creates the coping skills that you had and the person that you are. And you can start to communicate to those people in your life and make solid change moving forward on their end as well as your end, rather than stopping, fixing stuff in a void and then going back to life as normal and hoping that everything's going to transfer like sometimes happens with people in residential programs. It also makes it so that if your care team happens to be awful to you, you have more physical and emotional space from them um, and time to realize that and then do something about it and find a new care team. I have links and resources and outpatient options in the description. It is made by the professionals at Breaking Code Silence. I do recommend checking it out. But if inpatient or residential options feel like they're the best thing to do, that is okay and there's nothing wrong with that and there's no shame in that, but definitely good to do your research. Things that are one size fits all, we're gonna fix your troubled child, should be a should just be a red flag. You wanna see either programs with specialties or with very many different specialists within that program. Because unsurprisingly, one size fits all mental health care is just as weird as one size fits all medical health care. Location is also important. If a program is in the middle of nowhere and you also cannot visit it, maybe that's a deliberate choice on their part to make sure kids don't escape and or that nobody can randomly check in on what they're doing. Students should also have the ability to check themselves out at any time. Legal even in residential facilities, patients have the ability to check themselves out at any time, even against medical advice and even after 72 hour mandatory holds. Programs also have accreditation systems and checks and balances. Regional accreditation is considered the gold standard for schools, not national accreditation, though private schools have their own accreditation system across the country, but TTIs never fall within the private school network or framework of what um, independent schools across the country usually use. We also still have other forms of institutionalization in the form of residential schools for disabled students, some of which work almost identically to TTIs in their functioning, but also there are genuinely good and important residential boarding schools for disabled kids that function as proper schools and are doing really good and important work. So again, finding the difference between them involves doing a little bit more research and looking into the accreditation because once you know what you're looking for and how to spot it and where in the sideways sections of the internet to find more information, these places are pretty easy to spot and avoid. When it comes down to it, mental health care is a mess in the United States, particularly for kids, and knowing that parents are desperate for solutions and desperate to fix their kids and make them better, some companies just decided to capitalize on that and to capitalize on the fact that there aren't a lot of laws protecting children and there aren't a lot of laws protecting mentally ill people in this country, and then blatantly lie to vulnerable families to get their money and abuse their children in the name of helping, but instead causing just a whole lot of harm. But anyway, that's where I'm gonna leave this video. Just like with the last video, I wish I had solutions for you. I wish I could say something that makes us feel a little bit better about this whole situation, but that feels pretty disingenuous to the reality of where we are with the troubled teen industry today. I will say I'm seeing more conversations about it and more awareness about it. Thank you, Paris Hilton. Um, and I'm hoping that in our lifetimes, we will see the decline, if not closure of many of these institutions. Um, but for right now, the best that we can do is make a lot of noise about them, do our research and listen to and protect our kids um, I've linked some sources and resources in the description if you need them. Also, please check out part one of this video to learn about other forms of modern institutionalization that are still happening in this country, because I was gonna put them in this video, but it didn't flow right. Um, so they're all in there. And sending my love to anybody who survived this industry and is trying to pick up the pieces right now. As always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it is never too late to start over. And I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.